starting. This is the Wednesday night Bible study. I am glad that you guys are on uh, as an apostle of this place. You know, when we founded this place, we had a lot of things that we had to learn before the foundation of this house was ever uh, set forth on this ground. And one of the things that uh, we learned many years ago was to apply the Word of God to our life. And as we applied the Word of God to our life, um, our, the, not just our ears were open to faith, okay, uh, because faith comes by hearing, okay, but there was another particular uh, set of organs that opened up uh, in our life that we had never used as far as operating in the kingdom of God is concerned, and that is the eye gate, okay? The eye gate of our life, your eyes, all right, they open up, okay? They are open when you start getting into the Word of God and when you start allowing the Word of God to open up uh, your faith, and then your faith opens up your eyes. Then your eyes, it actually opens up your mind, and then your mind actually opens up your wonderful life, okay? And so when we first started years ago, I used to study a lot of things about the mind and how the mind was operating, and we studied things about, you know, faith and whatever, but all the time, the Holy Spirit was, bring, was bringing us around and sharing with us in different areas and opening up different areas of our life to us so that we would be able to open up things to other people. See, it's impossible for you to stand up and be a legitimate testimony of prosperity if you can't see prosperity, or healing if you can't see healing, or anything else. If you can't, if you can't see it and participate in it, it's impossible for you to be a legitimate witness of that thing. And so tonight what we're going to do is we're going to look at some of the things that share with us in the Word of God about being people that can see, because it's absolutely necessary for you to have your eyes open in these days, not just your ears open, okay? Faith comes by hearing, okay? But you have to understand that the fulfillment and the desire of things come through the eyes. The eyes play a very important role, all right? It's very instrumental in you obtaining uh, the blessings of God in your lifetime, not just seeing them afar off, but seeing them manifest in your life, okay? Because some people use their natural eyes and try to couple it with spiritual faith. And using your natural eyes and coupling with spiritual faith only causes you to see things afar off, okay? But God wants us to see things in the now. That's why faith is so important. Faith is now, okay? And so we're going to look at some scriptures tonight and some things that help us to understand the importance of having our eyes open. It's really the eye gate, okay? And it helps you to see into things that you normally cannot see into, okay? Now, everyone that I'm talking to tonight and everyone that's born into this world, okay, at some time or another, you have, you have, you have experienced some sense of limitation. All, right? all of you that are on the call, all of you that are, are watching this video right now, you have some place in life, all right, experience some, some sense of limitations in your life, okay? From the time you were born until the age that you are now, okay? Some sense of limitations have taken place in your life. And those limitations, they could have been financially, they could have been uh, influence that you didn't have for certain things or to get a certain place. It could be uh, limited relationships. And relationships are very important because it takes people that value you to get you where you need to be for success. And if they don't value you, even though you have a certain value system, if you don't have people around you that value you and your value system, no matter how many values you have, you can, you, it can still cause you not to be a successful person in the things that you want because we're all made to, to live from each other, right? The body of Christ, we live from each other. The cells, the body, the parts, the, the motivations, uh, the enthusiasms, the, uh, the resources, everything. We live, we live in one body. In him, we live and move and have our being. And so it's most important to have people around you that value you and that can and that value the values that you have. One of the sad things in life is that there are graveyards filled with people that have great values or testimonies and they died and took those treasures uh, to the grave with them, okay? And so in tonight's lesson, it is to help you to get beyond the limitations 
Okay, now you guys know I will talk about uh, prosperity, and prosperity to me is not just the money thing. It's the mind thing more so than the money thing, and it's the ability to live in any area of life and be successful in it. That's what prosperity really is all about. You can live in the area of, you know, just saying shopping, and you'll be the greatest shopper in the world. People will be wondering, how in the world she gets so many deals like that, or how is she always getting favor like that? It's because you have the mind to prosper in that particular world, okay? And so the more worlds that you can open up your mind to and prosper, understand how prosperity works, comes from the inside, not the outside, all right? Comes from the inside, not the outside, okay? Again, prosperity comes from the inside, not the outside. Expansion comes from the inside, not the outside. Everything on the outside tries to make you small, okay? Everything on the outside tries to make you small. But it's the greater one on the inside that enlarges your life and helps you, okay? So I want you to go with me to the book of Isaiah, chapter 54. And we're going to start right here tonight, okay? We're going to start right here. And this will help you to understand uh, why I used to make the statement, and I still make it sometimes, that you're either a prisoner of your past or you're a pioneer of your future, okay? You, wherever you are today, all right, the mental, the mental stability of your life is either holding you as a prisoner of your past or it's causing you to be a pioneer of your future, okay? It's causing you to go forward. Now, in Isaiah uh, chapter 54, are we going to look at this? Now, this is, again, prophetically speaking, this is coming after Jesus has, has come and did his work. And this is how, you know, much of the book of Isaiah is laid out in, in particular segments according to the prophetic word of God and the coming of the Messiah and then things that are going to happen uh, after that. And, and after Jesus has come, and we see this writing in chapter 53 about Jesus coming and the things he's going to do, but then we see in 54, it, it makes a statement to people that have been limited, okay? People that have been under limitations. And he makes the statement, he says, sing, O barren, okay? That's a person that's been under limitations, okay? I, I think of the kids that have been born here. There are at least four or maybe five kids that I could think of uh, right now that have been born here through, and, and the mothers were barren. They came here, hadn't had any successful uh, uh, childbearing uh, season, and some had lost two or three kids, you know, and that's, that's a tremendous uh, trauma upon a mother, you know, that want, want to be mother. But then I've seen the, the power of God bring children into this world through the prophetic word of God, just the word of God being spoken, and then, then things change. See, and this is how, how you have to understand when a person is living beyond what's on the outside and you start living on the basis of what's on the inside of you, you're going to see your whole world change. You're going to see it in a different way, okay? You're going to see things. And this is why I'm talking about this eye gate uh, today because people need to understand your eyes are a very important part of the manifestation of the blessings of God coming into your life, okay? Now, in Isaiah 54, he says, uh, Sing, O barren, that thou, thou that didst not bear, uh, break forth into singing, and cry aloud, thou uh, that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, says the Lord. But then he makes this statement, and this is what you got to get, okay? He says, Enlarge the place of your tent. Okay? Enlarge. That means... Uh, you're going to have to get uh, some perception of expansion, okay? You're going to have to get some, ex some perception of uh, there is more. So I need to do something in order to have more, you know? Uh, if your living room is 16 by 19 and you want to get more furniture in it, then uh, unless it's going to be crowded and packed up, then you're going to have to get a living room that's, say, 30 feet by 30 feet or something, you know? That'd be 900 square feet or whatever. You're just going to have to be able to do something like that and just make that room bigger. And this is what God is saying. He's saying, you that was barren, I want you to do this. Follow these instructions, okay? Enlarge the place of your tent and let them stretch forth and stretch forth the curtains of thine inhabitations. And then he says this, and you got to love this particular phrase here. He says, spare not. In other words, don't be stingy, all right? Be a risk taker. Okay, spare not. He says, lengthen thy cords and straighten thy stakes. Okay, spare not. Don't, don't be looking at what's on the outside. 
okay? Take in what I'm saying and see from the inside what's going to happen to you. As it says over in Ephesians chapter 3, according to the power that works in it within us, okay, he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask to think. See, it's the inside work, work of the Word of God that causes us to be able to see on the outside things that other people can't see, all right? And you've got to have an anointing to be able to not just always look at negative things, but to be able to look beyond the negative things and to look at the positive things that God is saying in his word. It's going to take a tremendous anointing to remove poverty spirits and spirits of lack and decline off of people in these days because most people tend to think on the outside first and then they look at God. They consider everything on the outside first above everything that they've heard or learned from the Word of God. And God is saying here, you that are limited, the barren one, you that have some limitation in your life, okay? He's saying, enlarge your place of your tent. Let them stretch forth now the curtains of thine habitations. In other words, you know something, those curtains, they're going to have to become bigger. You're going to have to have something stronger to hold them. And he says, spare not. Lengthen your cords and, stra and strengthen your stakes. In other words, you, you're going to have to get stronger now. You're going to have to get some things around you that are stronger now to hold that which is going to come to you. And he says, for thou shalt, and, and this is the second part of this. You notice how God always tells us to do something and then this will happen. He says, Luke 6, 38, give and it shall be given unto you. You remember that? Then, then guess what he says here? He says, enlarge your place. He says, for thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left. In other words, nobody's going to be able to slow you down. This is success, and this is expansion. And this is also a word of encouragement to somebody out here tonight because you've been struggling with stuff that you don't need to struggle with because you've been struggling with the circumstance, and instead of wrestling with the Word of God, you've been wrestling with the circumstance. See, the circumstance is going to always keep you in the same spot of wrestling. See, but God will wrestle with you through that thing to see how strong you are so that he can give you more strength than what you have. See, and this is what you get through, through having an eye to follow the word of God. And when God says, do this, then do. Have an eye to see what he's saying to do and not have the eye on circumstances, but on the, on the ability to see what he sees that can enlarge your life. So he gives us these divine instructions. And he says this, he says, for thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and your seed shall inherit the Gentiles and shall make the desolate cities to be inhabited. In other words, and this was spoken prophetically to Israel at the time because this is who God was dealing with, but it's also spoken relatively to you and I because God is dealing with us now, all right? And as the Gentiles, we're the ones who spread forth and spread the church. It wasn't the Jews that spread the church. It was the Gentiles. So this is speaking to you and I now uh, from the Word of God that God wants us to have a greater life than, than we think we should have, okay? And many times that comes through uh, people with an eye that try to give you their eye. They have an eye to circumstances that they've had. They have an eye to circumstances that they've lived through. They have a certain eye of experience that they've experienced. And if their eye is not walking in obedience and agreement with the word of God, then you should put some shades over thou eyes so that they can stop trying to give you thou eyes. And you need to look at God for who God is and what God has said. See, Numbers 23, 19, is a scripture that every person should have, every Christian should have as a priority of their life, that God is not a man. See, you're not dealing with a man, the limitations of a man, the thinkings of a man, the resources of a man. You're not dealing, you're dealing with Almighty God. And the word that God has given us to live is the same word that he himself would live here if he was walking on the earth with us. It is the very same word that he himself would live to show you that this word will produce time after time after time after time. And this is what you and I need to see, have our eyes open to see, that even in this time, you need your eyes to prosper. Because all of the things that are coming out on the world, all of the sorrows that are happening, you can't keep yourself focused on those things and be successful with God. You have to put your focus on the word of God that's in your heart. Because out of your heart, your heart's going to produce the power that you need for your success, not the things that the world are trying to show you. See, the enemy will always try to give you another picture because he doesn't want you to look at the true picture, okay? The true picture is that God never changes. His word never fails. That's the true picture, okay? Now, 
You can write these things down before we go over to Ephesians because this is something important. This is what happens when you begin to enlarge the place of your tents, okay? And this is some, some of the information that the enemy tries to cause you to have a blinded eye toward, okay? But when you start enlarging your mind, you start doing what God say do. You know, when we first came to the Lord, all of us, this is all of us, when we first came to the Lord, all of us had very small minds because we came out of the world. And even though we were successful in some things in the world, that's still a small mind to God because it's not a kingdom success. It was just a worldly success, okay? No matter what area it was in, it was still something that was very small because the way God thinks, God thinks above all that we even think anyway, the way he thinks, the way he sees things because of who he is, all right? So here's some things that you need to write down tonight, and this is what I'm saying. You need to follow me and get into this so that you can change some some of the great things that you want to happen in your life, they should happen today, okay? And when I said a little while ago, I, you know, I'm going to reach my hands through this phone and, and lay hands on somebody, and somebody's going to get their healing tonight. Somebody's going to get their blessing tonight. Somebody's going to do this. It's because Jesus told us to pray, okay? When we pray, we ought to pray for our daily bread. What's your daily bread? What do you need today, Okay. Do you need healing today? That's your daily bread. Do you need certain things today? That's immediacy. See, he, when he walked, he walked in immediacy. When he prayed for people, people didn't, didn't go away and stay for two or three weeks and then healing came. He, he, people got healed immediately. When he cast out devils, it was an immediacy thing. It wasn't something that he did and, you know, and then they went away and three or four days later, you know, they got delivered. No, some people need to be delivered right now. Some people need to be healed right now. Some people need a financial blessing right now. And our daily bread consists of God taking care of everything we need today. Not tomorrow, not next week, but today. And we've got this perception. Our eyes have been on longevity instead of on right now. See, when he healed, when Jesus healed, people were healed right now. When he fed the 5,000, when he fed the 4,000, guess what? They were fed right then. They weren't fed and, you know, well, you get a loaf and you go home and I'll be back next week. No, none of that took place. And even in the boat when the guys were, you know, bickering about they only had one loaf of bread. And Jesus told them, he said, listen, don't you see? Can't you see? You got eyes to see. Don't you have a mind? Can't you think? He says, don't you have ears? Don't you hear? He says, listen to what happened to with the seven loaves and the five loaves. He says, don't you understand that I'm Lord regardless of the amount, regardless of how big it is or how small it is, I can multiply to the point that you're going to have surplus even from the one loaf. He was trying to get them to see, to enlarge themselves, to get their eyes bigger than what their eyes were. And it's the same thing that he's doing with you and I today in this time because God has a harvest to bring in. And in order to bring a harvest in, harvest time is the, is, the, is the most laboring time of the year because you have to be very specific. You have to work very hard to get it in before other things change and the seed rot or the, or the supply rot in the field. And, and we're going to need every resource we can to gather the men and women of this world that want to go with the Lord. Okay? We're going to need that. Okay? So I want you to write this down. When you start looking forward and enlarging your place, okay, reduction is replaced by increase in enlargement. Remember, he's talking to old barren, the barren person, the limited person, reduction, things that have been reduced in your life, all right? When you start looking, looking on the inside and changing the outside, reduction starts, starts becoming enlargement, okay? I know some young people in this particular ministry that have listened to me over and over the years, and I see their life beginning to change. I see enlargement coming now. Reduction is getting out of their life, right? It's being removed, all right? Because there were certain things that they had to go through and change. They had to change their mind. They had to change their inside. But I see this happening, okay? And, and it should happen with everybody in the body of Christ, not just one particular house or that house or three or four, but it should happen with every house of prayer that there should be, the reduction should be, should be becoming shadowy now and, 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 you know, dematerializing. And the increase in the enlargement should be on a steady move and an increase in an uprising, okay? So write that down. Make sure you get that, okay? Decline is replaced now with improvement, with growth, 
all right, with fruitfulness, decline, okay? Some people fall under a spirit of decline. That spirit keeps you declining all your life, all right? No matter what you do, that spirit constantly works around you to keep your life declining. You used to work 20 hours. You had more money when you worked 20 hours. Now you work 80 and you have less. It's because those assignments of spirits that come against you to decline your life, okay, they enter in and they start working on everything around you to cause everything in your life to get to a place where it seems like God ain't working for you no matter how much you make, no matter how much you bless, that God ain't working for you. God's working for you, but there's an enemy that's got your back door open. See, if you're bringing groceries in the house and you're setting them in the kitchen and then you go back out to get more groceries, but you got the back door open and you got a thief out there that's watching you bring the groceries in, and as soon as you set them on the table, he runs in the house and grabs the groceries and runs out of the back door. And guess what? You're in a place of calling, uh, it's called decline. Because you can never get to a place of, of enlargement like that. You can never get to a place of fruitfulness like that. Please listen to me because I'm talking to somebody. And you need to grab this tonight. Because you, you've been praying, you've been believing God, you've been loving God, and you've been wondering where is God? God is where he's always been, on his throne. And he's watching everything, and he's speaking to you. He's speaking to you tonight through me. He's been speaking to you through years, through me and other people, my wife and everybody that he could, circumstances, situations. He's been speaking. But we got to get your, your eyes focused and not just your ears. Your eyes have to see, okay? And here's the third thing. Dead dreams are becoming replaced by resurrected visions. In other words, those old things that were dead to you now, you just forgot it. God's going to resurrect that and it's going to become a resurrected vision. It's going to become that which you're going to get up now. And no matter what happens, that vision is going to keep you going. You can see yourself again. You can see. That's what vision is all about. You can see that this is what God wants you to be. This is where he wants you to be. This is what he, he wants in your life. You can be able to see, Okay. So come on, go with me to Ephesians real quick. Ephesians. Now don't you guys lose me tonight because I want you to get this. Ephesians chapter 1. This is Paul praying. This is Paul writing about what he prays about. And he makes a statement here in Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 17 or verse 16, and he's talking about what he do, praying for people's faith. You know, we need to make sure we, we stay on line with these things because there's so many spiritual things that you can let slip because you're trying to get ahead so fast and you're trying to move and to get into this. And if you don't lay the foundations, there's no sense in building a house because you can let everything in a house. It's like a city with no walls, no defense. Everything can come in. It says this in verse 16, chapter 1, Ephesians, all right? And I know some of you are already reading it because I said it and you're going ahead. Uh, well, if you go ahead without the revelation, that's why you're where you are, all right? Because if you read and you read without a revelation of what it's trying to bring to you, then you can read and read and read and never get the revelation, which will never unlock the key, okay? Well, should I say never unlock the door with the key? Because the revelation is the key, okay? It unlocks the doors of the things of heaven, okay? He says, cease not to give thanks for you, and he's talking about himself, making mention of you in his what? Prayers. See, prayer is the most powerful thing that you and I have, okay? I, I see kids running up and down the streets. I've heard about them. I don't watch a whole lot of that uh, because I understand what it is, all right? Because I don't want my eyes to focus on more of that than I do on the time that we're living in and how God has said this time will manifest itself, okay? But they're talking about, about the point of slavery, what slavery did or how people treated us. And they don't realize that they're in the biggest, they're in the biggest slave trade right now, which is sin. See, sin is the biggest, the biggest slave bondage that you could ever be in. See, physical slavery, you can get delivered from it, okay? Time and 
and people and experiences and power can deliver you from physical things like that. But you're going to need a Savior to deliver you from spiritual slavery. See? And when you go against the laws of God, then you're putting yourself in a place of remaining a slave to sin. So you have to watch that. And I just said that, you know, because some people get this idea that what everybody's doing is right and this and that. There are things that are right as there are things that used to be true. But they have to be changed over time. It's a truth that you used to be a baby. But if you're 25 years old now, that truth has changed. But the will of God never does. Are you with me? Okay. The truth is, you used to be, you know, you used to be small and you ate a little bit, but you grew. And the truth is today, that truth that it used to be has changed. That now you may be a little larger. Truth. But the word of God does not change. Okay. So truth with us can change from season and cycles and experiences of life. But the truth of the word does not. It holds, it holds steadfast confidence in God and what God is going to do for you and I every day. And we should hold that same confidence because God, again, would live the same word that he's given to us. If he, when he walked here on the earth, he lived the word. And if he came back and walked, he would live the word. He would not be any different than his word. He and his word are one. All right? So we get into uh, Ephesians here, and it says this. He says, in his prayers, men ought to always pray and not faint, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, that the eyes, all right, this is what you have to understand, and you can mark this tonight, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know, this is no guesswork, all right, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints is, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us, who believe, who believe, okay, according to the working of his mighty power. So we see here that Paul was praying that people would have their eyes open, that they would be able to see spiritually, that you'd be able to see according to the word of God, okay, that you'd be able to see having your eyes open because it's absolutely necessary that the eye gate be opened, that you might see, so that you might obtain the promises of God. Absolutely necessary. See, if your eyes are closed and your ears are open, you can take in faith. Faith comes by hearing. But there'll be a dullness of being able to see the opportunities, to be able to see what God's really bringing you. There'll be a dullness to that, okay? Because your eyes are closed, your eyes are blind. And this is why you'll see uh, through the scriptures that the blind men, that whenever they heard about Jesus and they'd call him son of David, you know, they would run after Jesus. But there was one that did not run after Jesus. There was one blind man that his, his friends had to bring him to Jesus because he really wasn't interested. He really wasn't interested. And they brought him to Jesus and Jesus took him by the hand and laid him out of the city. He really was, he didn't seek Jesus. He was happy being blind. Some people are happy being blind. Some people are happy going to church and just saying, you know, yeah, by faith and, you know, and never receiving anything. Some people are just happy just going to church and sitting down. But that's not the person who's going to expand or extend his tents. The person who's going to extend his tents is the person who wants to see where to put the stakes where to enlarge, how to make the room right. See, that person wants to see. And so what we do is we run over to the book of Genesis real quick. Genesis chapter 13, come with me. So you got to have your eyes open. The Bible tells us to watch and pray. You know, have your eyes open. Know what's going on around you. Don't just close your eyes to everything and just say, you know, well, I'm living by faith. No, no, no. Open your eyes up and see what God wants you to have in these days. And if not for you, for someone else. You know, a person that's going to be a prosperous person. Again, the, the scripture started off talking about the barren person, the person who had limitations. 
All right? That person must understand that if I'm going to stretch out and I'm going to do this, I must be able to see what to do. And the only way you can see is to follow the Word of God and to see the pictures in the Word of God and to see all the things that Jesus laid out. In uh, Genesis chapter 13, here we go. Beginning in, uh, well, let's, let's check this out. Verse 10, verse 9, verse 8. This is the story of Lot and Abraham, uh, and, and Lot was being blessed because of Abraham. He was getting an overflow from the anointing that was on Abraham because it was Abraham that saw to leave his land, not Lot. It was Abraham that saw all the situations to build the altars and the, to praise, to pray to God and to, you know, to give the offerings to God. It was Abraham, it wasn't Lot. But because Lot was there, he was a family member, okay, then Lot was getting the overflow of Abraham's blessing and call from God, okay? Like most people do in the church, okay? Many people in the church, they, they line up and they get in that overflow because they see that there's an anointing, you know, there. And that anointing is the only thing that can help you see, that anointing, okay? You read uh, Romans chapter 4, it says Abraham, because of the anointing on his life, he didn't look at Sarah's body, he didn't look at his body, he didn't look at his age, he didn't look at anything on the outside, he looked at the promise that he had of God from on the inside, okay? So it takes an anointed person to be able to see. And this is why you got to have your eyes open in these days. And the anointing does that. It helps you, okay? It says that uh, they, were, they were arguing, Abraham's and, and Lot's servants were arguing, and Abraham and Lot got together. And it says this, and uh, Abraham said, you know, if you go this way, I'll go this way. If you go this way, I'll go this way. But let there be no confusion and stuff between us, okay? We're, we're family, okay? So it shouldn't be any confusion between us. And he says, uh, in verse 10, it says, Lot lifted up his what? His ears? No, he lifted up his eyes. And he beheld all the plain of the Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, even as the garden of the Lord, and like the land of Egypt as, uh, come, as you come out of Zohar. And then Lot chose for him all the plain of the Jordan. Why? Because he saw it with his eyes. Nobody came back and said, oh, Lot, you know, all of this is that over there, and this is over here, and whatever. No, no, no. He saw that with his eyes. And because he saw it with his eyes, no matter what he had heard from, from Abraham, guess what? He chose the best. Isn't that something? He wasn't the one that was anointed with the call or the blessings, but he chose the best. He wanted the best for himself. You ever seen people like that? Yes, you have. We're not going there tonight. All right, let's go back to this. All right? It says, then, and it says, Abraham, verse 12, Abraham dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the, in the cities of the plain, um, pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom uh, were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. They're still like that today, all right? But we're not going there tonight. And it says, and then the Lord said to Abraham after Lot was separated from him, he said, lift up your what? Your eyes. See, he had heard. He had faith to hear his ears. So you got these gates in your, in your body that the enemy uses, your eye gate, your ear gate, and your mind gate. And he uses these things to try to control you, manipulate you. And you got to make sure that you're using all three of them with the word of God to sustain yourself, all right? And he says this, the Lord told him, said, to lift up your eyes. Lift up what? Lift up your what? Lift up your eyes, he said unto him, Lift up your eyes and look from the place where thou art, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. In other words, it don't make no, no, no difference where Lot go. All of it belongs to you. I want you to see it. All right? He says, for all the land which thou what? See. See? That means that your eyes are involved in bringing the desires of God into your life. See, you've got to be able to see further than the circumstances around you. See? And this is why he was talking about the barren person, not living by your limitations of what you see around you, but by getting the word inside of you and enlarge yourself, and then this will happen, okay? And one of the great ways that you and I enlarge ourselves is getting the word inside of us. We enlarge our thinking. We change everything. And then the Lord goes on to tell him, I'll make this, and I'll cause this to happen, and I'll do this. Why? Because he wanted him to see. Now we go to chapter 15 while you're right here in Genesis, all right? And in chapter 15, 
in verse, two, verse 1 through 6. The Lord shows up with Abraham again, and he says, and Abraham said, Lord God, verse 2, what will thou give me seeing? He says, you can see too. See this? Seeing, all right, that I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, this shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad, and he said unto him, Look now toward heaven. In other words, open up your eyes. I want you to see beyond the one person in your house and start looking beyond, all right, to the multitude of the stars. And this is how your house is going to be. See, he's, he's brought him out to use his eyes. See? Use your eyes to see. Yes, God has promised you. You have taken in the word of faith. Now begin to allow your eyes to see what God has promised you. If he promised you healing, then see yourself whole. Stop looking at your body on the outside. Stop looking at the, the medicine you take. You know, stop looking at all the doctor's reports. Every night you're going to sit down and look at the doctor's report. The doctor said this. Every night you're going to sit down and look at your copay payments that you paid. Stop looking at all those things. Stop looking at the medicine cabinet. In fact, take it out of your bathroom and start looking at what God promised you. He promised you healing. So see yourself whole. See yourself, if he promised you the new job, then guess what? See yourself making the, signing the check every week or whenever they pay you. See yourself putting deposit in that check into the bank account. See yourself spending that money that's coming from that place. If God promised you something, he's not a man that he should lie. Nor the son of man. He's not going to repent of something that he promised you. And you've got to understand, he wants you to see beyond your circumstance. He says he brought him out. He told him, look at the stars. See? He said, look at the stars. Come on, go with me to 2 Peter real quick. Got something I want to show you. 2 Peter. See, the eyes are most important to expand your territory, to expand. It's an absolute atrocity before the Holy Spirit to hear all the word on prosperity and then be so stingy to invest in yourself. Well, I'm not going to buy no shoes for me because I think the Lord just want me to wear these until I wear them out. It's an atrocity. It's, it's, a, it's, it's almost blasphemy to say that the Lord don't want you to be prosperous when he's already told you in his word, beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper, be in health, even as your soul prospers. Who, who do you think directed those words to be written? The inspiration of the Holy Spirit was on that man to write that. And then we deny it. And we walk away from it. See, to be enlarged, you have to, again, we have to come back against these spirits. You have to stand against these spirits that's trying to reduce your life every day. Spirits that try to delay your life. You know, there are spirits, that's right. Somebody, you just thought about that, huh? Yes, there are spirits that try to delay you because they will use people around you that should be there to inspire, to open up the doors, to lay the path, to, to invite things in, and they will, he will use those people to delay your life. That's right. The reason that business didn't take off the way it should is because, guess what? Spirits of disappointment came against you because spirits of delay were working against other people that would not give you the favor to help you and now the disappointment spirits come against you now to make you think that God don't want you to have that. See, you got to have eyes to be able to see that there are more things that are out there that do not want you to be successful than your boss or the banker. There are more people, more things out there that are trying to hinder you. And somebody's going to say, oh, man, you're preaching fire and brimstone. Well, it's better to get it now than to get it later. Don't you think? Don't you think it's better to get it now? And you can be purified and, and your tongue can be pure and you can go back and say, I had a tongue of unclean people, but now that's changed. I'm speaking what God wants me to speak. Hallelujah. All right? Some of you are going to find out where that is in the Bible in a little bit. Okay? But in 2 Peter, come on, go on me to 2 Peter real quick. 
We're talking about how powerful it is for the eyes to be able to be clear. Okay? In 2 Peter chapter 2, look what it says. We're going to begin in verse 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Got to get this now. This is God. He's not a man. All right? And he says, spared not the old world. He didn't spare a whole world. Can you imagine that? No, you can't. Not if you're carnal. God didn't spare a whole world. Hmm. Spared not the old world, but saved Noah and the eighth per person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world uh, of, of the ungodly. And he says, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example. Say what? Making them a what? An example. What's an example? It's something that teaches you a lesson. Making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. See, that example is still sitting there for them today. But again, independence from God will always bring defiance toward God. See? And it says, and this, this is the point I want you to see. And deliver just lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing, not just hearing, but in seeing and hearing, it vexed his righteous soul from day to day with our unlawful deeds. So this is why you got to watch what you put your eyes upon in these days. See, if your eyes are filled with more of what people are doing and how they are acting and whatever, then guess what? Sooner or later, that's just a ploy of the enemy to delay you from getting to somewhere that he knows that you're about to step in. And you got to watch how you focus on all that stuff instead of focusing on the righteousness of Almighty God. And when you focus on that kind of stuff, it begins to vex your soul. In other words, it begins to bring a shadow. And then that shadow brings another shadow. And then those shadows bring a few more shadows. And then guess what? While you're still seeing a little bit of light, because you can still see a little bit of light when, you know, when the shadows come. But sooner or later, enough shadows come that now your mind is filled with darkness. And it got there so fast. And it got there so subtle that you don't even know how it got there. It says that when the angels came to Sodom and Gomorrah, it says Lot was sitting there as an elder at the gate. So that's why you got to watch what you not only hear, but what you put your eyes on. See, and the enemy knows that most Christian people won't read that. He knows that most of them, no matter what they see, they think it doesn't bother them. Oh, yes, it does. It does bother you because it's one of the subtle ways of the enemy stealing from you the ability to go forward because he wants to keep your mind on him, see, more so than you focusing on God because when you focus on God, you become the apple of God's eye. When you focus on the enemy, you become a target of theft, death, destruction. Anybody in the house with me? Amen. So come on, go with me to Mark chapter 8. And I'm going to let you loose. I'm going to loose you tonight. I'm going to loose you tonight. See, eyes are very important. See, confusion and deception and darkness, those are things that must go. But when those things go, I must replace them with something. And so I must have the right attitudes, I must have the right choices, I must have the right decisions, right? This is something that I wrote, I did this many years ago, and I did a 26-week thing here on, on finances and stuff, and I, I wrote it down because it's something that, that you probably need to hear before I finish this last scripture. You do not determine your destiny. You personally do not determine your destiny. Your de you determine your decision. Again, you don't determine your destiny. You determine your decisions. See, Adam determined his decisions. 
all right? And his decisions determined his destiny. I wrote that down many years ago. I taught that in here for, for quite a few weeks, all right? Again, I'm going to say it. You do not determine your destiny. You determine your decisions. And your decisions determine your destiny. See? And if your eyes are blind, all right, if your eyes are close to what God wants you to have, because I've seen this so many times, you know, God will share with me things and I will, and I will see these things just floating, you know, in the spirit realm, waiting for people to grab and to hold on to those things. And you'll speak things out and then a little poverty mind will come and, and, they'll, and they'll look in the wallet, you know, to see how much money they got in the wallet. So you're going to look at what you have versus what God wants to give you. And you decide that what you have is greater than what God wants to give you. I told you I'm going to set you free. See, because when it comes down to the choices that we make, when we make a decision, every decision takes you in a direction. That's a part of what I had here. Every decision that you make takes you in a direction. My wife used to say years ago, you didn't just leave home, go to 7-Eleven and commit adultery. See, you already had a decision. And that decision took you in a direction. And, and, and nobody can say, well, that was your destiny. No, that wasn't your destiny. That was your decision. See, your decision happened. And see, when God shares with you that he wants you to be a certain way or he wants you to have a certain amount of this or he wants this blessing to come into your life and whatever, he wants these things. Let me tell you something. When God is showing those things to you, it's your decision that will make those things happen, not God's. He's already shown us through the word of God that this is the way he would live. So if he would live this way, it's got to be good enough for you and I. You in Mark chapter 8, don't fall off the couch now. In Mark chapter 8, this is after the disciples had seen Jesus feed the multitudes a couple of times. Twice he's fed the multitudes. And in verse Verse 15, uh, verse 13, verse 13. It says, and he left them and entered into the ship and again departed to the other side. And uh, it says, now the disciples had forgotten to take bread and uh, neither had they in the, in the ship with them more than one loaf. Now this is one loaf compared to five loaves and seven loaves. One loaf. And it says, then he charged them saying, because you know Jesus always knew what was going on in their minds. He charged them saying, he says, take heed. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. All right? What was the leaven of the Pharisees and, and Herod? They wanted signs based on what they wanted, not what God was giving them. All right? And I've seen people like that. They, they want a sign that they want, that God's doing this. But you forget all the signs that God has already placed around you. All right? He saved you out of that family when no one else even cared about you in that family. He gave you that job that, guess what? You don't even deserve that job, but God gave it to you. In fact, you don't even have the credentials for where you are, but God gave you that job. God gave you those children, and they're growing up, and sometimes they seem like they're out in the world. But God also gave you prayer, and he says the seed of the righteous shall be delivered. He gave you prayer, so God gave you a way out of that too. But you want God to give you something devised by your own mind. And that was the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod. Show us a sign. Get, let, let, let me be the one to say this is the right sign. And God is saying, no, I'm not going to do that. I show you a sign every morning. Every morning when I, when I put my hand on the sky and there's a painting there, I'm showing you right then that I'm God. Every night when you go out and you look at the stars, there's a sign right there that I'm Almighty God. They haven't moved. They're still there. Every year the seasons come and go. I'm a God. I'm God. I told you that the seasons would come and go. How much more sign do you want? I gave you my son. He hung on the cross. He said, Father, forgive them. How much more of a sign do you want? He's still healing the sick, raising the dead. He's still saving people. But you want your own personal sign. 
Well, it's not good enough, Lord, that you saved them or you healed them or you healed them this way. I want you to heal me like this. Really? When did you really get that special? And this is what the Pharisees wanted. They wanted their own sign. Jesus said, I ain't talking to you. So there's one sign that's out there, and that's going to be the sign of Jonah. If you don't understand that one, guess what? You won't understand anything else. He told Herod, he says, you're a fox. That's your sign. You know, and you know how sly a fox is. <laughs> it says, they reason among themselves. Now, this is the, the disciples he's talking to, saying, it is because we have no bread. Now, they thought Jesus was telling us because they had no bread. Just like some people say that Jesus, you know, well, it's because, you know, I did this, Jesus ain't blessing me. No, no, no. When Jesus knew it, he said unto them, and you got to get this. Why reason you that deals with your mind? Because you have no bread. Perceive you not, neither understand. Have you, have you your heart yet hardened? Having eyes, see not. Having ears, hear not. And do you remember? When I break the five loaves among the 5,000, how many basketfuls of fragments took you up? And they said, 12. And he says, and when the seven among the four, how many basketfuls did you take up? And they, now he's talking about surplus now. You got to get this. He's talking about surplus. He ain't talking about all the mouths that got fed. He's talking about surplus. And this is why you got to know, he wants your tents enlarged. He wants your life to be larger than it is. He wants you to have so much that you can give it away and still never be concerned about what you got. We've been duped. He says, and when the seven among the 4,000, how many basketfuls of fragments did you take up? And they said, seven. And he says unto them, how is it that you do not understand this? I'm not talking about your one loaf, boys. Because I can take the one loaf and still have all kinds of surplus. So he said, and listen to Jesus. He says, your mind Your ears and your eyes must be involved in seeing the greatness of God. And I'm telling you tonight, or it might be day when you're watching this, you're going to have to get beyond your little self and get into his big self so that you can start seeing that God wants you blessed. And every day you should tell spirits of reduction or decrease that I bind you in the name of Jesus and I cast you out of my life. And I'm inviting now to be a bond servant, to increase in favor from the most high God. That I'm going to live a life full. I'm going to, in fact, tell them, say this in your confession, say, I'm qualified because God qualified me to live this kind of life. See? God qualified me. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. See, he qualified me for this. And anybody that's coming against you to, to I guess, again, to decline your life, you should stand against them. It doesn't matter who it is. It can be the preacher in the pulpit. It can be your neighbor, your best, your best friend. If they're coming against you and telling you that I devalue your value of God's word, you need to let them go. Because people around you, they're going to bring you the consequences or the rewards of their life into your life. And if they have a small mind, that small mind is going to always try to make your world small. They're going to try to get you offended at your value system. See? And you need to hold on to your value system, understanding that the Lord has told me to enlarge my tents. And because he's told me to enlarge my tents, he doesn't want me to be barren. He doesn't want me to be limited. He wants me to walk in abundance, and he wants me to have a great life. And I'm going with the Lord because he's not a man that he would lie. Nor the son of man, that he's restricted to the ways of man. Amen. I got to stop right there because we're going in time. And you guys know when I get to going in all of these things about prosperity, there's so many things in here about total prosperity. I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about your health. I'm talking about your mental state. I'm talking about the people that you have around your life. That's wealth. I'm talking about the things that you have in your house. When you walk in your house, you should see things that remind you of the victories, remind you of the blessings of God. You know, when I walk in my house, people have given me some things that remind me of their kindness. 
People have given my wife things that remind us of God's kindness to us. I used to have them at it years ago when somebody gave me something, you know, and then they got ugly, that I'd just get rid of it. And the Lord told me, he says, they didn't give it to you. I gave it. And so I had to stop right there and go like, forgive me for that. I got that revelation now. When something comes into my life, I know it's because God loves me. When it comes into your life, you ought to know it's because God loves you. Regardless of how it came, you ought to know God's got his eye on you, and he just wants you to have that, you know? And I have some very expensive things, my wife can tell you. And I look around at him sometimes, and I say, Lord, wow. And he's just going like, I wanted you to have that because I know you like that. I know you like that. I know you like that. And I'm just going like, thank you, Lord. In the midst of everything, he's going to take care of you, and he's going to bless your life. He's going to enlarge your life. But you've got to put his word in you, and you've got to trust that word inside of you, all right? And let it become bigger. Read Romans chapter 4 when you get home. I don't have the time to go over tonight. But see how Abraham would not look at the things on the outside. He would not look at Sarah's body. He would not look at his own body. He would not look at their age. He would not look at the age of the servants that he'd raised up in his house. He looked at the promise of God. And he says, that promise wants me to be enlarged like the stars. And that's what I'm holding on to. Amen? Amen. God bless you. If you're not born again, well, you probably are after all of this, if you've listened to all of this tonight, uh, this evening. But if you're not born again, please ask Jesus Christ to come into your life right now where you are. He'll do it immediately. He won't wait two weeks, three weeks. He'll do it immediately. He'll come into your life tonight in Jesus' name. Do that. And, and the word tells us that he will refuse no one who calls upon him in sincerity. So call upon him in sincerity and watch the dramatic change that will begin to take place in your life. And then call us, let us know you got born again, all right? We'd like to know. We'd like to keep praying for you. Pray that you get into a, you know, a word-oriented foundation, foundational church just like this one and get into a, a life where committed people have an atmosphere where they believe a big, dream big, and they receive big in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? God bless you. Uh, Apostle Rock signing off. Have a great evening. Bingo. <laughs>